Are you sure you want to do that? Yes, I do. So hello and welcome to everybody who is with us on YouTube. We have a room full of people chatting away in Connect, but there is also opportunity for you to live chat if you are watching this live. So feel free to put your comments in. And if you're watching the video later, hello and welcome. And uh, feel free to put your questions in as comments and I will get back to you with them. But before we go any further, I'm going to get my slides up and uh, we will be good to go. So first thing I'm going to do is share my desktop with YouTube and get my slides going. And there we are. I can see them. You can see them. We are good to go. So hello, good evening and welcome officially. And tonight we're looking at Photoshop text magic. For those of you who don't know, I'm Elaine Giles. I'm a trainer. I have been a trainer for many, many years and currently I'm presenting the Map Bytes podcast. I am also the user group manager for the Northwest Adobe user group in the UK. Uh, we are an official Adobe user group. We have meetings locally and we also have meetings online and this is indeed one of those meetings. So hello and welcome to everybody who is here uh, after the official Adobe tweets. So tonight, text. First step, make sure that you're using the right font for the job. You have on your system lots of fonts installed, but you can get literally millions more fonts available online. And how critical is it to start with the right font? Well, absolutely critical. I'm hoping to show you this by playing a little game. So if you're there in your chat, get ready to put in the answers to these quiz questions. So I'm saying fonts incredibly important. Half your job's done if you choose the right font. And then within Photoshop or Pixelmator or Acorn, you can do uh, extra things with that. Turn them into works of art if necessary. But first job, get the right font. So who recognises that font? That is a font that I've downloaded from the internet. It was completely free. And I've given you a bit of a clue with the image on the right hand side, but that font is not a serious font. It's uh, quite a youthful font. It's quite childish and it is perfect for what it is. So anybody giving you the right answer there, Mike, as to what that font is or where they've seen it before? <laughs> no, it's an elephant, but it's not an L font. No. OK, that is indeed Walt Disney's font. And um, it's one of those things when you see the W and the D, which you've got there on Disney and Dumbo, should be instantly recognisable to you. Um, they use that font all over and it is instantly recognisable as being that. You would not use that on a CV. Well, not if you wanted the job, you wouldn't. Let's try another one. Here's another one for you. And again, bit of a clue in the text there. A mystery drama from the 80s uh, from the States, but also shown worldwide, I believe. Anybody got any clues there? Nobody having a go? Oh, come on, somebody must have seen it. I used to love it. I've recently seen it again and um, can't say it was as good as I thought it was the first time round. Anybody had a good guess? Gary's tight. Gary's typing, so Gary's got a clue. I bet he knows it. It's very, very well known, this. You should know it. Right, it is Murder, She Wrote, which uh, was a mystery series, as I'm saying. And that had I iconic text. In fact, so iconic that this, which is a copy of that font, is called Lansbury. So it's called Lansbury after Angela Lansbury, who starred in it. You'll also find another font that is virtually identical to that. And that font is called Fletcher. That, that was the character she played in it. So fonts incredibly important. Now, they are fonts that are out there. And if you use one of those fonts for a project of yours, you might think, I don't really want to be doing that because, you know, it's too instantly identifiable with another role. And in this case, a TV programme or films. Just to give you a very practical example, this was something that I put together a few years ago for a webinar. And the webinar was called Raw Alchemy and the Secrets of the Digital Darkroom. And what I wanted to convey with the text that I used was the magic side of it, so alchemy. And I wanted to drill into something that was already there. So that font, anybody any idea what that font's based on? That's another very well-known font. And I just think in this circumstance, it actually works. It enhances what I was trying to say. It was the right tone. Um, there are two separate fonts there, actually. The first one at the top where it says Raw Alchemy is called Harry P. And it's based on the Harry Potter font. 
And the one below it is also based on Harry Potter, but a slightly different kind of font. That was exactly what I was trying to convey. Now, just to give you an idea practically here in, in terms of something that I made, so not in terms of a film or a TV programme, just look how different that looks with a completely different font. So this font is a font that ships on the Mac by default. It's called Markerfelt and it's completely wrong as far as I'm concerned. If I was trying to use that in terms of maybe um, a children's playgroup or something, then maybe it would be perfect. But for what I wanted to convey, I didn't think that was the right tone at all. So same words in exactly the same place, exactly the same size. Only difference was the font and it's made a massive difference to it. So tonight I shall be taking some plain text like that. That's uh, Avenir, by the way. And I'll be making magic with it in Photoshop. So literally starting with just plain text, few words and doing various things with it. So there's a sneak peek of what we'll be doing. And without further ado, I'm going to go into the demo and show you that. So first things to do. I need to get Photoshop up, which I've got ready and waiting. But before I actually go that far, I'm just going to show you I've talked about fonts. What I didn't explain was how to install those fonts. So I'll show you first on a Mac. And here is a finder window on my Mac. This is how you would install a font manually on a Mac. You've got three alternatives when it comes to installing these fonts that you find. You can install them manually, you could use a font manager, or you could use a service such as Typekit. Well, the easiest way to do it would be manually. So here is a finder window looking at my uh, user folder. So Macintosh HD, Users, Elaine G. And where you need to put your fonts is in the library folder, which is not displayed by default. So I'm going to up, go up to go and I'm holding down the option key. And when I hold down that option key, it toggles on and off the library. So clicking on there takes me into the library and within the library you have a fonts folder. I've double clicked on there and you can see I have got those fonts installed. These are installed into my library fonts folder. So this is where I put fonts. As soon as I install a machine, I put the custom fonts in there that I absolutely need to make this machine work. And that particular font is just one font with six, seven variations of it. That's the font I use for coding. So all you need to do to install a font on a Mac is drag and drop it into that folder and you are good to go. Now on Windows, it's slightly different. It would be, wouldn't it? But here is a Windows 8 installation. And very simple to do it on Windows as well. You right click on this start menu at the bottom, up to control panel, and that opens up your control panel. Within there, you have an option for appearance and personalization. So click on there. And one of the options in there is fonts. So clicking on fonts, that takes you through to exactly the right place. And all you have to do to install a font there is drag and drop the file into that folder. So it couldn't be easier to actually install fonts, even if you're doing it manually. But you don't have to do it manually if you don't want. So what I've got here is a font manager. So this is the second way that you could work with fonts. You could work with a font manager. And this one I've got is Font Explorer 10 Pro or Font Explorer X Pro. Now, why bother with something like this if it's so simple to install them? Well, this allows me to maintain all my fonts on an external drive. And when I come to a new machine, and I want to activate the fonts, I can do just that. I can just activate them. I don't need to move them into my system where if I lose my hard drive, I've lost all my fonts. Also, when you put your fonts, when you install your fonts onto a system, they're going in one folder. There's very little in the way of organizing them going on, which is what a font manager gives you here. So let's have a look what we've actually got there. Take that full screen. First of all, I've got all the fonts I've got installed, so 948 of them. And here they all are, alf alphabetical. And if I'm not sure what a font looks like, and I'm thinking, do I want to use that font or not? You could click on that font there and it gives you a preview. You can even type your own text in there. So, hello world. I can add that and see what that looks like, or I can take all that flat text away and put whatever. So if I'm trying to put use it for a logo and I've got a company name, I can put that in there and it will preview that. 
As I say, the most important thing for me in here is managing fonts. So as I've said, I have discussed the Harry Potter fonts and I actually have a folder here. So let me just show you that. Harry Potter and magic fonts. And what I've got in there are all the fonts that I have downloaded as being part of Harry Potter. So they are, um, in this case, Harry P that I've used. That Harrington we've seen, that was the font that was on the, uh, the initial poster for tonight's event. So where it says Photoshop Text Magic, the font is Harrington. And I've got this one that's called New, and it isn't really new, that's Lumos. Um, it's just that when it was made, they didn't put a name in correctly, but that's the font. And uh, to be sure, if I click on there, you can see the preview at the bottom, and it is that font that we saw on the Raw Alchemy slide. So this gives me a huge benefit in terms of font management. If I want to activate a font, all I've got to do is go and find the font. So there's another font, Hogwarts Wizard. And all I've got to do is put a tick in the box. That's it, that's installed for me. It's not moved it from my external drive to my fonts folder. It's left it where it is, but it's put a pointer to it and activated it. So I don't have to move it. In fact, in my system, on my external hard drive, I actually have a folder called Harry Potter and Magic Fonts, which means if I find another one, I can just add it to that folder and come in here and activate it at will. So as you can see, I've got a few other fonts in here. I've got Speciality Fonts. I've got Earwig Factory Regular. Mm, what's that? That's the one that I had on the slide that says choose the right font. There's Lansbury which was the Murder, She Wrote font. And there's Waltograph, which is the Disney font. So those I've called speciality fonts and I've got them in a folder on my external hard drive. So that's it for a font manager. So that can be really useful. Can also deactivate fonts in here when they're no longer needed. So I prefer to use a font manager, but we now have a third option, which is to use something called Typekit. Now Typekit is available from Creative Cloud. So up here, I have my Creative Cloud application. And uh, if you've got a Creative Cloud subscription, you'll be intimately familiar with that. That is where you control it all. So I've gone into there and I have a few tabs, the first of which is Home. And that gives me an activity feed. It says you install Bridge, you install Photoshop, Illustrator, and it's a history of what I've done here. You can also see that I've installed a font. So two days ago, I installed a font. I can control my applications in here, so I've installed these. I've got this synchronizing my files up to Creative Cloud. There is a Behance option, so there is my work on Behance. Haven't added anything yet, but getting round to it. And the last option is Fonts, and this is the interface that you have to a service called Typekit. And what you can do from here is either manage your fonts, or you can just browse for fonts on Typekit. So I'm going to click Browse Fonts on Typekit and I'm going to bring in here my browser and it's logged me in as me. So I have a Typekit account via my Adobe ID. And because I have an active subscription to Creative Cloud, I have access to all of these fonts free of charge. And I can use these fonts in one of two ways. So just scrolling down, showing you what sort of fonts are available there and there are a lot more so I'll just keep loading in an extra few as well. Uh, what I can do with these fonts, use them in two ways, I can use them on the web, I can use them as web fonts but I can also use them for desktop use and what I've got here because I activated this from my desktop via that Creative Cloud app this is already enabled so show me all the fonts that are available for desktop use but I could toggle that off and elect to just see all fonts. In which case, these first three here are available for web and desktop. And that's what these tiny icons mean at the bottom. So just showing you that, that icon means it's available for the web. That icon means it's available for the desktop. And if we move across to that one, that Brandon one is not available for the desktop. That is web only. So if I just want to see what I can use in Photoshop on the desktop, I would put that in as my search over here and then scroll on down to look at them. Now, I'm looking for a particular kind of font that I intend to use later on. And in true Blue Peter style, I hope you're British if you understand that, then you will. If not, it means here's one I did earlier.
So what I'm looking at in here, I'm looking for a particular type of font that would suit a demonstration I'm doing. And I don't particularly want to scroll through all of them just looking for it. So what I can do is go to the top and I can choose to browse lists. And what this gives me is groups the fonts together. So alternatives to Helvetica, alternatives to Georgia. And as I keep going down and going across when I get to the bottom of the page, I'm looking for something specific. So I mentioned having a code font. There are code fonts. I can use all these different kind of code fonts. Keep going. And what I'm looking for is something that would look good for that True Grit poster. So looking across, you see I've got sci-fi, typewriter fonts, also got a demo that the typewriter fonts would look good with. And here is the Wild West collection. And it tells you there's eight fonts in that collection. So I'm going to go into there and it then actually shows you those fonts. Now, I have one of these installed already. That is this one. This is the one that I have done earlier. And the reason that I did that was, in my opinion, when you install these fonts, it should be instant or at least instant within a minute or so. It took about 25 minutes for that font to appear in my fonts. And that's why I wasn't risking it on the night. But I will show you how I can actually install one of these things. So I'm going to choose a different one. I will choose this one, which is Rosewood Standard Fill. So I go into there to have a look at it and I get a preview. I can see that. I can look at specimens of it at different sizes. I can test the type. I can actually click in here and edit it. So let's put in Macbytes. Seem to have lost the ability to type. There you go. So you can actually see that before you install it. You're doing this on the web. And you can look at samples in the browser as well if you want to. So what did it look like on OS 10? What would it look like on Vista and so forth? but I want to use this font. So I'm going to move up to this use font and click on there. And it shows me what's selected. It tells me it's ready to sync. Now, what it means by sync is not only install to this particular machine that I'm sat at now, but it will also mark that and install it on all the other machines that I have an active Creative Cloud subscription on. So I'm going to sync the selected font and it says it's sorting it out. Launch the Creative Cloud. Now, that's one thing you need to know with this. You need the Creative Cloud application running for that font to be available. It's licensed because you have a Creative Cloud subscription. So I've got that running in this top left hand, uh, top right hand corner up here. So that should be fine. Launch it. I'll do that. And um, it should show me that it's going to install it. So there's the one that I've already got installed. When that one that I have said, please install this, appears, it will appear in this window. So uh, we'll come back to that. It could take, you never know, five, ten minutes, maybe more. But that is using Typekit. So Typekit is an online service. The benefits of your online service is you don't have to manage those fonts in terms of keeping them on an external drive or installing them on your internal drive. You don't have to worry about the files at all. It will do it for you. As I say, that is available with a Creative Cloud subscription. If you have the photography program subscription, uh, you only have a cut down version of that. If you want the full version of that, you can get that for an extra forty nine dollars. So those are your three options when it comes to installing those fonts. But let's assume that you've got all the fonts installed that you would like to have installed. And what I'm going to do now is run Photoshop and let's have a look at some of these demos. So I shall go and get my first one, which was the fatal error. We've seen that on the slide as I got going. And this is my starting point for fatal error. So get that up to full size and show you what we're aiming for. And let's see how we can get there. So there is the finished product. And uh, what we've got here, it's a fairly standard text, so fairly standard font. It's got some nice effects on it to give it that kind of scan line look. Now, how well that's coming across on uh, YouTube, on the video or in Connect, not too sure. Let me know in the chat. Let me know if it's uh, looking as good as that. Uh, Mike can uh, tweet the uh, image there. So put the link in for the finished product and then you can actually see it. So I'll make sure all these links are available from YouTube after the event too. So that's what we're aiming for. And all I'm starting with is a black background. So first thing to do, get the text tool. So T for the text tool and click on my image. And that one said fatal error. So I'm going to type fatal error. And as you can see, not exactly the right font. 
but we'll, we'll get there. So I'm going to do that and move this so it's in the right place. It's completely the wrong font, but not to worry about it. So to go in there and edit that. And I used a very standard font, which is Myriad Pro. Now, there is an alternative to Myriad Pro, which is... Um, when I remember what it is, it's PT something or PS something, because Myriad Pro is a paid for font. So if you have access to Myriad Pro, go for that. But to be honest, anything that's fairly big and blocky will work. So I've got the font there. I'm making that 250, so 250 points. And there we go. That's what it looks like at the moment. Now, first thing to think about, need to make that a decent colour. So it was some kind of green. And I do actually have a specific green. So I'm going to copy that colour go back into here, select it all, and I'm going to paste in the hex code for that colour, which is a very bright green. So it's 31 DD37, so a brightish green. And that is now purple because it's selected, but if I click away, you can see it is actually green. Now, first thing to do is really simple. What I need to do, I need it glowing. So I want to add an outer glow to that text. So moving down to the bottom here, I've got some special effects and one of those is outer glow. So clicking on there and it brings up this window. So an outer glow is part of the layer styles collection. So you have all these layer styles available on the left hand side. What I'm going to do is configure this set of options here in the outer glow so I get the right effect. Now you can see it, it has actually applied something already, but it it looks purplish, very purplish at the edges. That's not what I'm looking for at all. I don't want the blend mode to be screen because it's, it would be too plain. So I'm going to make that normal. And I'm going to change the colour from this pale lemon. I'm going to change it so it's that green because that's the colour that I want to see. I want it to look as though the colour is bleeding out from the actual font. So uh, make it that green. Then I need to go into here and I need to change the size of it. At five pixels, it's way too small. But if I start taking that up, you can see the effect coming into play. And from experience, about 50 to 54 is about right. So I'll do that there. That's the only change I need to make to that. So I change the size of it and I change the color of it. And that is all I need to do to get my outer glow. Now, the next thing is a little bit more subtle. So, so far, so good there. Next thing is I'm going to put in an inner glow. So this time up to inner glow, it takes me to the same dialog box and I can go to the outer glow. So I can navigate with this list on the left hand side too. So I'm gonna go into the inner glow and this time I want it to be an overlay blend mode and I want it to be white. Now that might sound a bit strange, but if I choose the white and then we toggle it on and off, you can see it's very subtle, but it just lifts that slightly around the edges. So if I toggle that in a glow on and off, you can see without it, it looks very, very flat, but with it, it gives it a little bit of a lift off the back of the page. And I want it to be a bit bigger than that. So I'm going to make it 10. So it gives it more, even more of a lift. Again, toggle it off, very flat, turn it back on, much improved. And uh, down here, I'm going to change the jitter on that as well, just to give it a bit of a randomization. Take that up a bit. And I can take that quite high, actually, to around 50 there, 48, 50. And OK, so it's starting to pull together at that point. But the original... So I'm going to turn off what I've done and let's have a look at what we're aiming for. Looked very different because it had the scan lines across it. So that's the next step. We need to do something about that. So going into here. And what I need to do is give it a fill so I can create those scan lines. So I'm going to do something. I'm going to go away and I'm going to make a pattern. So I'm going to, uh, I'll save that file if we don't want to lose anything. And I'm going to make a new file. So I'll just say yes to that. Don't worry about the size of it at the moment, because the size that I need is very small, literally very, very tiny. I only need it to be really small. So I'm going to go into image and uh, image size. And in here, I'm going to make it incredibly tiny. It only needs to be two pixels wide and four pixels tall. In fact, you could probably get away with less than that. In fact, I don't think that was right, was it? Let me zoom in. No, I don't want it like that. Let me go back into there. I need to go to image size and I need it two pixels wide. So I don't need that linked. Two pixels by four pixels. That is right. 
And now what I need to do is to grab half of it, so knead it like that, actually making sure I've got the marquee, the square marquee tool. And this time what I'm going to do is fill that top with black. And that gives me a very tiny image, very tiny. And it just has, in effect, a couple of pixels, one half black, one half white. This will make a lot more sense in a moment because what I'm going to do with it now is turn this image into a pattern. So up to edit and down to define pattern. And I'm going to call that scan lines. And I'm going to make sure it's called demo because I already have a scan lines in there. So there is my image. I don't really have to save that. Don't need to save it at all. I've just defined it as a pattern. So I'm going to go back to my image. Now this time what I need to do, I've got my pattern now. What I want to do is make sure that I've got some scan lines across the top of this. So what I'm going to do is make a new layer. And I'm going to put it right at the top of the layer stack here underneath the complete. So layer two. I'm just going to name that scan line so we know what it is. And what I need to do with it is to fill the whole layer. Now you could fill the layer with a colour, that would be simple. If I fill it with black, that's what it looks like. Or I could fill it with white, so fill it with white. But what I need to do is fill it with a pattern. So up to edit and down to fill. That gives me the fill dialog. And in here you can use the foreground colour, the background colour, any other colour or a pattern. I want to use a pattern. And the pattern I want to use is this last one that I created, but you do have a lot of others available. But it's this last one that I created there. So scan lines demo, one pixel by four pixels. There we go. And that should be probably strobing across your screen because what it is is alternate white and black lines. Make sure that that's what it is. Zoom into it and you can see that's exactly what it is. Just white and black lines. So zoom out so we can see the whole image. So what do I need to do with that in order to have it blend in nicely with the background, clues in the name? I need to change the blend mode. So my blend modes are available from within here. I happen to know that what I need is a multiply blend mode. There it is. But you could just have, go through them. If you're not sure, you get a completely different effect with overlay. Uh, you could go to screen. That would give you a very different effect again. So if you're not sure, just have a look through them. But dark and multiply works quite nicely and as does overlay. So any of those doesn't really matter. Overlay makes it much brighter. So what I've got there is an actual, what it's done is it has taken the lines on the topmost layer and blended them in with the one below. And because it's overlay, it's, it's created quite a nice glow effect on that. But I don't have any lines on the actual black background, which if I just turn both of these off in this one, I did. The lines were in the middle here and they were also coming out of the side as well. So slightly different in the completed version. So let's turn these back on and um, have another go with that. Let's add some uh, to the background. So let's add another layer to that and uh, have a look at that. So I've got that there. What I now need to do is create another layer and do another fill on there, which is, there is a shortcut for that. It is shift and F5 and do an okay on that because it's using the same pattern there. So not a problem with that at all. And what I'm going to do with this one is set it to multiply. You can see it's now starting to go way too much. But what I'm going to do with it is I'm going to move it. I'm going to move it behind there and uh, turn these off a bit so I can start to work with it. So let me uh, get back so I can actually see it. Let's go to normal so I can actually see it. What I need to do with this is to make it available to the rest of the... Um, in fact, you know what? I'm going to do this a different way. I know what I'll do. I'll do it a slightly different way. I will get a new layer and I will do it uh, with a mask. That way it will be far easier. So what I'm going to do with this layer is put a colour on it and I'm going to use that green colour. So I'm going to uh, use a fill here. I'm going to choose that green colour by pasting it in. So let's do, let's do it that way. Now I've got that there, I can fill the whole thing with green. This will give us a different way of doing it. So I've got it filled with green. What I'm now going to do is put a mask on it. So uh, let me put a mask on there. And this time, instead of doing it directly to the layer by filling it, I'm going to fill the mask. So making sure I've got the mask selected, go back to my Shift F5 and fill that on there like that. 
Then if I come in here and I change that to uh, multiply, and you're not going to see anything until I move it because you need to have the text available and we need that available too. And if I put that at the top there, and we're not seeing it too well at all at the moment, are we? Let me go back to normal with that. There we are. That looks better, doesn't it? What I need to do is uh, take the opacity down of that. So it's just about right. But the problem with it is it's gone right across it and it didn't on the original. So what I'm going to do now is work on this by putting something else on the mask. So instead of just having the pattern on the mask, I'm going to change the mask slightly by going and getting the marquee tool and choosing the elliptical marquee. Draw that out so it's just about right. It doesn't have to be precise because I can move it. And I'm going to move it there so it sits over the top of that. And then I'm going to change that. I'm going to uh, change the selection by modifying it and I'm going to feather it. I'm going to feather it quite a lot. So 200 pixels, that's quite a lot. And then invert it. And now what I've got selected is all the area around the fatal error text. So all of that around there. And making sure I'm on the mask here, I am going to do a fill there. So what I've done is filled it with black. And now when I deselect it, I've got the, the lines around here, but not going up to the edges. And the, because I've done it as a mask and a layer and all the rest of that, it means that I can control it now with the opacity. So if I want it to be a very strong effect, I can take the opacity up. If I want it to be more subtle, I can take it down. So somewhere around the 40 mark is probably about right for that. And we've got something that is very similar to the original. So let's just have a look at the original. Turn off those three layers. There's the original. I think I've gone for even stronger this time, haven't I? And let's turn those back on. And there they are. Now, that's OK, but, you know, it's all right if you want a poster that says Fatal Error. What could you actually do with something like that? And that's where the Photoshop side of it comes in. Work on just the text like that. But when you've got the image, you can then take that image into another image and start doing things with it. So what I've got in here, I'm on my secondary monitor and what I'm doing is opening another image. So here's another image that I was working with earlier. And what I have here, and I'm just looking for my finished product, which will save me exporting it again. I have my finished product. There we go. So this is just an image uh, from a stock photo site, completely free. And this is what I did with it, which was that I took the text and I put it on that monitor. That is the text that I actually created and I put it on the monitor and it's really simple to do. It couldn't be easier. So let me just show you that. What I have here is a JPEG and I'm just dragging that JPEG into the top of this image. And there is the one I did earlier. And I'm just going to press enter on that. That has brought it in as a smart image. So here it is, a smart object. And I'm just going to put that right above the background over on the right. And now what I need to do with it is make sure that that image is smaller and fits on that monitor. And the way not to do it, don't just go in and resize it and then think that's not going to look great because it's just slapped over the top. Once you've resized it and you've got it down to manageable, change the opacity so you can see the monitor behind it as well. And then right click and say distort. And now each one of these points on this image can be moved independently. So if I drag it up to that corner and then do the same for the other corners. So dragging them into the corner, be as neat as you can be, but it's non-destructive. So you can always go back and edit this later and just drag each corner to a corner on that monitor and it looks like it was actually on that screen. And then press enter to accept that. And got it right, perfect there first time. Let me just zoom in so you can see that. There it is. And the only other change I made to this image, so zoom back out, was that I added a levels adjustment to it. And the reason that I did that was to give it a bit of punch. It looked a little bit flat. So I took the white point across and then I put the black point across as well. And you can change the gray point in there if you want it a lot darker. So it looks like a threat or if you want it lighter. And I went for lighter. I did something like that with it. And uh, if you turn that on and off, you can see the effect of that. 
let's fold that up so you can see it. So I wanted it to be really vibrant. But that's the kind of thing you can do with the text once you've um, created it. So uh, that one was a fatal error. So I'll save that. So do we have any questions yet? Have we got questions? Oh, we haven't got any single questions. Good grief. I hope you're all still with me then. Don't forget, you can always put the questions in under the YouTube video as well. So let me move on with another example. So similar stuff, similar stuff. This one is the true grit one. So in here, I have a starting point and it's that. It's very, very plain. All it is is a background. And again, that was a free background. So uh, make sure that the links are available so you can download these. And the first thing, well, let me show you what it looks like when I'd finished. We went from that and I did have some text in there as well. That was the text. Obviously, it didn't look like that when I'd finished. But that's the starting point. But the finished article looks like that. So how do we go from plain white text to that? OK, so here's my background. First thing I want to do with my background is probably to duplicate it. So duplicate the layer. And that means that I've got some control there with the background. If I set that to multiply, I get a much darker background and I can also change the opacity. So if I want to lighten it up a bit, I can do that. So duplicate the background first. Then I actually have the text. So this was just text that I put in earlier. This text was that Rosewood font. So this font is, is from Typekit. So I don't actually own this font. I've licensed it via my Creative Cloud subscription. And at the moment it's in it's in white, but it needs to be in a different colour. And I have a different colour for that. So I'm what I'm doing on my other screen, if you're interested in me, what I'm doing in my other screen is this. I've got Colour Schema Studio and I have all my demos and I have all the colours I need. So that's what I'm doing off on the other screen. Can't recommend that app highly enough. OK, so I've got that there. What I need to do is to go into the font make sure I've selected it all and change it to that brown color. So going in there and pasting it down there and OK, and there it is. So just to show you now the font is a brownish color. And the next thing I need to do, I need to uh, recolor that. So I've done that. And now I need to do pretty much what I did before, which is to add an outer glow. But this time I don't want it to be a bright outer glow. I want it to be much darker. So I'm going to do go down to the special effects and I'm going to go to outer glow. But I want it to be darker. So I don't want it to screen it. I want it to darken it or multiply it. So I'm going to go to multiply. Also don't want it to be this yellowy color. Uh, I'll, I'll try the same brown. If it's too dark, let's not worry about it. There we go. And I now need to make sure that it's bigger. So I want the opacity set a little bit less. So I'll take that down. Might need to come and change that as well. And I need to uh, make it spread much more because it needs to look as though this was branded on it. So I need to increase the size and the spread of it. So I'm going there for something like... Uh, Oh, don't think I need the spread quite that much. I'll take that down a little bit. Just needs to darken the background on it. So that doesn't look too bad. And yep, all of that looks absolutely fine. So it just gives me more of a background to it there. So OK on that. So I've got that background. Just need to do something with this font. So I'm going to change the blend mode of the text layer and change that to multiply. And now it looks like it's been burnt into it. But what makes that different from the completed version? So let me just check the completed. Yeah, I've got the background in it so I can turn it on and off. You can see it is actually much darker. So it's more brown than red. And also, if I zoom in there and we look at something like that T, that font there looks distressed at the edges, a bit grungy, a bit grungy. If I turn that off, you can see this one is, is pixel perfect at the edges. And that's a bit of a problem. So let's come out of there so we can see it all. What I'm going to do to make a normal font that isn't, you see, you can get grunge fonts, but rather than actually go and buy a grunge font, you can grunge up your own fonts. So this is how you grunge up your own fonts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a mask on there. So let's add a mask to that. And what I'm going to do is go and get a brush. So get the brush tool, but instead of using a smoothish brush, what I'm going to do is use a grungy brush, but just to show you what this will do, if I start painting on that mask with black, so I've got black down here, 
and I've got a solid brush. As I start, uh, let me get there like that. Tell me that you are working here. There we go. And uh, you should be disappearing. You should definitely be disappearing. Let me see what's happening. Oh dear me, what's going on? I should be drawing on there and you should be working and you're not. Okay, what I'm going to do with that is convert it to a smart object. That might help and add that mask back to it. Right, let's try that again. Brush. And it's not doing it for me. It is not doing it for me tonight. Not happy about this. Oh, there's always something goes wrong, isn't there? Hmm, let me think about that. What is happening with it? Let me set that back to normal and see if I can get it working. I definitely want you to see this. No, it's not having it. What on earth? Okay, that's set to hard mix. That's not good. That might be a good start. There we go. That's better. So if I start painting, remembering what I'm doing here, I'm painting on this mask. I am not painting there. So I'm not erasing it because if I turn the mask off, the font comes back. Hmm, that's important. If I paint with white, it brings it all back. Okay, so using that principle, now we know that principle, what I can do with this is make it back to multiply, which is how it should be. I can make sure I'm on the mask, make sure I've got the brush tool and use a different brush. So these are standard brushes, these ship with Photoshop, but you could use any brush that you can find that gives you the right effect. So I'm just going to choose a brush and as I hover over it, it gives you a preview of the brush. And now if I just um, use black and start drawing on it, you can see it starts distressing the text at the edges. So I'm, I'll make that a bit smaller and just start painting in over the edges. And you can see there, just distressing the edges. And as I, just to prove the point, I'm gonna choose different brushes. So let's try that one. That one looks pretty good too. And just drawing in here like that and distressing the edges. So I'm not gonna to take too long to do it perfectly, but you get the idea. It starts to make it look and randomize the size of it and randomize the placement of it. And remember, it's non-destructive. If you think, oh, good grief, I've taken too much away. Look, I've taken too much away there. You can paint with white and bring it back. So just bring it back as much as you need. So randomize the size, randomize the um, location of it. So bring it back and there, like that, that's it. So randomizing is your friend, just randomize that. And I found when I started doing it, it was quite addictive. It actually looked better if I went around every piece of text and even took some of the middle bits out as well. And it starts to bring back the grain in the wood. So as I say, I'm not gonna to take too long and make it perfect. You have got the idea there. Just grunge up the edges of that. And um, one of the last things I did with this to um, make it look even better was I added a layers adjustment to it. So if I go back and I add another layers adjustment to it, so into, uh, that's levels, isn't it? Not layers adjustment, a levels adjustment. Brighten up the edges, but darken the darker bits, and it makes it look more burnt in and move that gray to uh, to change the tone slightly in, in the mid ranges. So uh, you don't want it too bright at the edges like that. So we went from plain white on wood to burnt in and grunged up your own font. So rather than spending money on an extra font, you can grunge up your own fonts. Now we've seen with that one that all I've done with that is put plain text on a flat background. So it's very 2D effect. Now the fatal error one did have a 3D kind of element to it because we were putting it onto a screen. But the benefit with putting it onto a flat object like a screen is it's easy. It's easy to get it onto a screen. All you need to do is make it into a smart object. That helps a bit and then transform it. But what if you wanted to put something on a real object? And that is the next demo, which is the top secret file. And this again was uh, from a stock photo site. So free of charge and I'll make the link available. And what I did with this was make it top secret. So actually take some standard text and put it onto an object, but actually morph it into the object so it looks like it's part of the object. Just to show you that, if I zoom in so we can see the top side of that, you can actually even see the grain coming through the text. So it looks like it's stamped on it or embossed on it. So how do we do that? It's actually very straightforward. So first thing I need to do, get the text. So get the text tool, T for the text tool, and click on there and type top secret. 
obviously, at the moment. It's going to have the rosewood font, which we don't want. Not a good effect. Now you can see how fonts can change the tone of something. Now I'm going to use a font that ships on the Mac, which is called Stencil. So Stencil is in here somewhere, aren't you? Don't make a liar out of me. Where's Stencil? There's Stencil up there. But this works fantastically well with typewriter font and there's a whole range of um, different Stencil fonts to have a play with. So uh, I'm going for that one, but pretty much any type of font like that will work well. Now you can see it doesn't sit properly at all. It doesn't look like it's part of it. That is the problem with it. So I've got the right font. The colour's not too bad either. What I need to do with that is to transform it. And before I transform it, I'm going to convert it into a smart object. And that gives me extra options with the font. I can do more things with it because it's a smart object. But in essence, what I need to do with it is to transform it. So Command and T or Control and T to transform it. And I'm going to opt to distort it first. And I want it to look like it's on that file. So I need to tip it backwards. Then I need to bring this side in so about there. I need to bring this edge back in and make sure that it's sort of lining up properly with it. That's not too bad. But then I'm going to right click again and say warp. And what I want to do with it now, be careful with warp to show you it can go way out very quickly. I just want to bring it down a fraction at the bottom because this file is bending and I want it to look like that text is bending too, but only ever so fractionally and bring the top down again, just literally one or two pixels is enough. And that's actually slightly bent there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to then go to rotate and I'm just going to turn it around slightly like that. So for a quick demo, that's not too bad. If I was being pedantic with it, I'd drag this T back down as well. Should I do that? Should I just go and do that? Command and T again, and let's go to distort and just pull that T down a little bit. That's a bit better. Right, so I've got that there. Next thing I need to do is to do things with a font you probably wouldn't think of doing, which is blur it slightly and um, add some drop shadow to it. So I'm going to first of all add the drop shadow. So into my effects, my layer style takes me to the drop shadow and I'm not looking to add a lot of drop shadow to it. So just fractionally, certainly don't need it that dark either. I just want it to, to raise slightly. So I'm going to take that down to 30%. And that is literally just enough. If I toggle that on and off, it's very subtle, but it does actually add something to it. So there's my drop shadow. Now, I want to add some blur to the text, and this is one of the reasons I converted it to a smart object. I can blur the text and it remain editable if I add it as a smart object. So I'm going in there to blur and down to Gaussian or Gaussian blur and zoom that so we can actually see it. There it is. And I only really need a little bit. Obviously, you don't want to take it too crazy because it starts to uh, not look right at all, but somewhere between 2 and 2.5 is about right, just a little bit and OK to that. Now, the next thing I need to do is I need it to be red, but I don't want it to be bright red by changing the colour of it. So I'm going to add that as another effect. I'm going to add it as a colour overlay and that makes it red. As you can see, it is a little bit too red. But what I can do with that is take the opacity of that down and get it to something like the right colour. So something like that's about right. So 39, 40%. And then all I need to do is to lower the opacity of the whole thing. And as I do that, let's take that down a bit. Uh, it's been a bit laggy here. There we go. About 55, 40, somewhere between 40 and 50%, I would reckon would be about right. And you have added text to it. And just to prove the point, I'm going to zoom in there. And you can see the grain coming through what I've added to it. There are lots of things that you could do with that in relation to different effects. But that now actually looks like it's part of that rather than being sat on the top of it. It actually looks like it is part of it. So lots of opportunities to do things with text in that way. So save that file. Now the next demo is uh, something a bit different. 
Have you heard of Wordles? Who's heard of a Wordle? Let me know if you've heard of a Wordle. If you haven't, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this from my browser. I'm going to show you what a Wordle is. I use these quite a lot in presentations and uh, the training and education work that I do. And in essence, it's keywords or you could use a whole phrase. And the words are laid out, as you can see, in randomised ways, different sizes, different colours, and it gives you a nice effect. They are very, very popular in presentations, a little bit different than your bullet points. So I'm going to be looking at Wordles because the problem with doing a Wordle is if you were to do that manually, and I have done it manually, it takes too long. It takes forever because you start tinkering with the right font, the right size. You start changing the layout. Let's automate it. Photoshop can help you here. What I've got is um, a little plugin. So first of all, I'm going to get a, a nice image to work with. So I have got a very nice image here to work with. And it is, um, let me open that. So I'm opening the image now. It will pop up in Photoshop. There we go. So I've opted for a black and white image, but it can just as easily work with colour. But I've gone for this one because it's very high contrast and it will demonstrate it very well. It's a little plugin called um, Typo Painter, which is just $5 at the moment. So I'll make sure that that link's available. Other than that, if it's not on special offer, it's $10. So I'm going to open that up. And it is a plugin for Photoshop that gives you this dialog box. And in this dialog box, you can configure how this Wordle will work. And what it will do is it will take the text that you put in it. The text goes in at the bottom here, so down there. And it will lay that out across your image using the font you select on the right hand side. And then it gives you some options here with your horizontal resolution and the size multiplier to create the precise effect that you're looking for. So to see this in action, I need some text and I have got some text here. This is my text. So I'll just show you the text. It is a text file and it is Steve Jobs' Here's to the Crazy Ones quote. So all I'm doing is copying that out of my text editor and pasting it into my enter your text box. And then what I'm going to do, so let's just make that come up to the top, is update the text. So once I click update the text and it goes away and it thinks about it, it updates the text in this preview here. Then I need to choose some fonts and uh, I've got lots of fonts to choose from. As I choose that, you can see it really changes it. So that particular look with something like Baskerville is something I've seen in like an educational supplement for the times, something like that. But you can create very different effects by choosing different fonts. So it's really a case of finding one that is a font you want to work with or finding a font that you particularly like or fits in with what it is that you're turning into a Wordle. So that one's very, very modern, whereas something like Garamond is more traditional. Then, as I say, you can in here, you can zoom in and out. But what I'm going to do is just change that and show you that if I take the horizontal resolution up, it makes the text much bigger. If I take it down the other way, you get much more detailed image. So you can take it right across to 80 over there. So I want it quite small and detailed. I want it to look like the image. And then I can use this, which affects the density of it. As I move it across to the right, it gives me a much more dense text uh, on, on the image. So it, harder to read, to be honest. But if you take it all the way back over here, um, it starts to look like one of those word finder puzzles. So somewhere in the middle is probably about right. And once you've done that, so you've got your image, you've chosen your font, you put your text in and you've adjusted the density and the resolution. You then have a couple of things you can do with it. You can choose to save it to an EPS, which will create a vector file for you. And that's fantastic if what you want to do is scale the image. What I'm going to elect to do for speed is just open it in Photoshop, though. So going there to open it in Photoshop. And there is my image created in Photoshop. Now, the only problem that I have with this particular thing, it works fabulously on colour images and it works much better if what you want is just a, a version of the image in text format. But if what you're trying to do is put it on a presentation, which is nine times out of ten what I'm trying to do, you can't actually read too much of that text. You couldn't see that that was the crazy ones without really, really you know, zooming into it and, and trying to read it. So I love that as a plugin. It's fantastic. But there is an alternative and the alternative I actually use more than I use that dedicated plugin.
So this application is called Wordify and I can just show you there in the App Store. Let's go to Wordify. There we go. And as you can see, I've already got it installed. There it is. It, there is a birthday sale on, as luck would have it, until the 1st of May, and it's just £1.99. So I will show you what you can do with this. This is awesome. Love this. So that's the app. Let's have a look at it here. I don't want to run Microsoft Word. Right, Wordify. There we go. Right, very simple. I'm going to take the same image, so the same picture of Steve Jobs, and drag and drop it into drag and drop the picture here box. There it is. Now what I need to do with it is configure it. So I'm going to go into the configuration options here. And this actually has the correct text in because I've rehearsed this, believe it or not. So it's got the correct text in. But you can just do what I did, which is just select this and copy and paste. So those are the words and moving across. The next thing is choose a font. So at the moment it's set to Helvetica, but I could go in here and choose something different, but I'm going to leave it set to Helvetica. You can even randomise it by saying surprise me. So the third set of options is what sort of colours do you want in it? And I'm just going to leave it as black and white, but I could, you know, add a lot more colour into this if I wanted to. And the last set of options is the word alignment. So do you want them all horizontal, vertical? You could randomise them. You can then say, you know, what word count and size. Do you want more words and have them smaller? Do you want fewer words and having them bigger? And then you've got your output format. So PDF, PNG or JPEG. Now, obviously, JPEG, small file size, great for putting online. PNG will give you transparency, which could be really good if you want to integrate this with another image. But don't discount PDF because a PDF is vectorized. It's vector and that means it scales perfectly. So I'm actually going to go for a vector uh, PDF and I'm going to use that in Photoshop. So what I'm doing here, I've got all my configuration options. I'm now going to click this play button and what that's going to do is think about it and then do it. And there it is. Now, looking at that, it opens it up in preview and it is a PDF, one page PDF. And looking at that, I can think, yep, that's OK, because I've got misfit quotes, crazy. I've got some really good words there. The to and the of, I'd probably change it. And it is random. It is completely random. So if I come out of that and elect to do it again, it will give me totally different words. So now I've got rebels in there and I could keep doing that until I'm happy with what I see. But I've got crazy ones. I've got differently. So I'm quite happy with that. So there is my PDF. What I'm going to do with that is save it to the desktop. So just save it on the desktop there. And it should be behind. So I'm going to close down Wordify. It should be behind Photoshop. So move that out of the way. And there it is. Now, what I'm going to do with that, I'm going to bring it in to another image. So I'm going to go and open that other image. And this image is an image of infinite loop on the Apple campus. And what I want it to look like is very integrated with this. So let's have a look at the after. This is what I'm aiming for. Multicolours, the right size, the right place. Oh, some drop shadow on it. Looks like I'm there and having done this to their sign personally, I hope. OK, so how to do that? Well, behind Photoshop, I have the PDF. I'm just going to drag and drop that PDF on top of that image. And it says open as a smart object. And that's what I want. So OK to open it as a smart object. And now bring Photoshop back. And here it is, and you can see behind it, it's transparent because we can see everything. If I move that over the Apple logo, you can see it's completely transparent. It's also a little bit big, so what I'm going to do is scale that down. I want that on that campus sign, so let's move it up there. And I want it to align on the bottom and the right-hand side, and I want it to go right to the top there. So we could even lose a little bit of his head at the top there. And press Enter to accept that. And that actually looks quite effective as it is, but it's a vector and it's a smart object. So you can now format this in many, many different ways. So up here is where we have the smart object. So you can see you've got the smart object symbol. And what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to open up this menu, which is my styles. And all I've done in here is you have some default styles that are available. And you probably have not the one I've got selected, but the one I've selected is textures. 
and it says, do you want to replace them? Yes, I do. And it opens up these textures. And there's one that works really nicely, which is this one. And this is called Abstract Fire. And making sure that I've got my Wordify selected, which I have, I can just click that and it applies that style to it. So now I've got the, multi the multiple colours of the old Apple logo on there. And now it does need to be a bit smaller because you can see his head hanging off the top. So what I'll do with that is I shall go back into that and make it a bit smaller so it fits. There we go. Now all that has done, that style, all a style is, is a collection of formatting. Most of which you've seen me do tonight on different examples. So just to show you, if I go into... Uh, up here where it says effects it is actually two effects it's the gradient overlay and the pattern overlay so there they are and they are actually available from down here so pattern overlay gradient overlay the difference is it's just done them both automatically so it's a way that I can do that without having to go in and manually configure all these options there's the gradient overlay there's the pattern overlay so if I pull that to the side and turn these off you can see the effect. So you've got the pattern overlay and the gradient overlay with the colours. And it has just applied those as a recipe all together to save me actually doing it. So styles, textures, abstract, fire for that one. And uh, we have a very nice Steve Jobs there by using a tiny little helper application that does actually give you something. I mean, I use this in presentations, but you could use this in any kind of image. It doesn't even have to be a person. It could be the Apple logo. It could be anything. And then that becomes an ob object within a larger image like this. So instead of just saying, well, you know, I've got this image of Steve Jobs and uh, I've turned it into where is it now? This typo paint one, that, and that's my finished product. No, carry on and take it further. Take it into another image and it becomes a component part of that image. So that was using uh, creating Wordles, both with a plugin, Typo Painter, and also with that helper app called Wordify. But I'm going to go back to my slides now because I've, I've done almost. So fonts, where can you find them? There are lots of fonts. Uh, these are just a few sites that I use. Uh, used to use Acid Font all the time. Very good site. But um, any of these sites um, are excellent. Da Font also has paid for fonts, but many, many of the fonts are free specifically for non-commercial use. But you'll also find fonts there that are free for commercial use. So there are all these kinds of sites that you can get there. There's also places like Deviant Arts that you can find fonts. And just to reiterate how you get those installed, on the Mac, if you're doing it manually, you need to go to the Macintosh HD, Users, your username, then hold down the option key to get the library shown, go to the library and put them in the fonts folder. If you're on Windows, you need to go to your start menu and navigate down through your control panel into appearance and drag and drop them in. Now, I talked about a font manager, which was a Font Explorer Pro, but there's also another one called Suitcase Fusion. So you have options with that. They are both cross-platform and they come in under the £100 mark. But they, you know, if you only want to use one or two fonts, it's probably overkill. I just find it far easier for working on multiple machines and just managing the sheer number of fonts that I actually have. And the third option is to use a service like Typekit. So this comes free if you have your Creative Cloud account. I will uh, go and see later if that font ever actually installed. I'm sure it did. It just takes its time. So Typekit and services give you benefits here that you can install fonts like that. So you don't have to own the font, manage the font. You just say synchronize this for me and it will synchronize. Remember, not just to the current machine, but to any machine that you have activated on your Creative Cloud subscription. Which brings into question, this Mac that I've been working on tonight is a relatively new Mac and I didn't have Rosewood installed. I do actually own Rosewood, I have the file on my hard drive somewhere, but I just thought, oh, how much easier to just say, yep, install that and it did it. On my other machine, my older machine that has all these fonts installed, this was what I saw. It said, you've already got this installed. So I won't install it on this one because you would have a conflict. So it's intelligent font management as well. It knows what you've got installed and it works with that. So what I could do with that is either say, OK, leave that alone. 
not not too worried about that. I'll leave it on this machine or I could go and uninstall my copy of it and then use the copy from Typekit. And as I say, all of that is because I have a Creative Cloud subscription. You can get a Creative Cloud account for free and you can keep that account for free forever. It will give you 30 days trial of the applications and that will include Typekit because it is actively licensed. So once your trial is over, then your Typekit trial is over. As I said, if you want a subscription to Typekit, then you can get that separately from the Creative Cloud for $49.99. Then there was the other applications that we had a look at. That one was called Wordify. At the moment, it's only $1.99. And I just love what that can do. As you can see there, this one I did the other day and I've got yet a different look to it. I've got rules and crazy and ones uh, highlighted on that one. I've even got troublemakers across the top of his head. So I particularly like that one. So that is Wordify. And you can use these Wordles or Wordify files within any type of application to give you a fantastic effect with it. So that's it for font magic in uh, Photoshop. A lot of the things that you saw me do there, you can also do in Pixelmator and you can also do in Acorn or if you're on the PC, Paint Shop Pro. The script was Photoshop only, but many of the other techniques and the Wordify um, can work no matter what application you're working with. So if you have enjoyed that, feel free to join me next time when we'll be looking at editing video in Photoshop. And that is on the 13th of May. Same time, same place. And then in June, we're taking a look at Photoshop brushes. So you've seen me use some brushes tonight to grungify the fonts. That's only the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more that you can do with Photoshop brushes. And uh, that will be happening on the 19th of June. And just to remind you, I have been Elaine Giles and you can find me all over the internet as Elaine Giles. Specifically my blog, which is elainegiles.co.uk, but also on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+, you name it, I, I am there and uh, there are all the links. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear what you're doing with Photoshop. Are you using Photoshop? Maybe you're using something else. And if you've made some examples with this, I would love to see those as well. So do, do get in touch. But until next time, it is good night from me and I'm going to head off for some Q&A. Hey.